In this video, I'm going to talk about shrinkage, shrinkage methods. Um, shrinkage methods are relevant in um, empirical contexts that are high dimensional, which means that the number of regressors is very large and can even be larger than the total number of observations. Um, examples from real life are, for example, if uh, Amazon is trying to predict what a given consumer might buy, then the regressors might be the number of products he has bought of any other type of products. They have bazillion different products. They may even have more products than they have um, customers in their customer database, uh, but probably at least on the same order. So a high dimensional model uh, might, for example, Here's one example, just be our standard linear model with Gaussian uh, innovations where the, the dimension of x is greater than the number of observations. And uh, there's an important distinction between what happens asymptotically. If k is fixed, then the problem is simply that how do we find the betas uh, given the data that we have, but asymptotically is a completely different thing because eventually n will become much, much, much larger than k, even though if k starts out very small. So for example, if we're trying to find the gene for cancer, then there are thousands of genes, but there are potentially billions of humans that we might uh, do a, a gene screening of. So it's just a matter that of it being very costly to get more data. However, there are other models where the number of variables grows as the number of observation grows. For example, in certain pure effects models and in the Amazon case before, where they get more and more products over time um, while they also get more observations, but the number of products keeps growing. So these are some of the settings. Um, there are two ways to go about a problem like this, two main ones that we talk about in this course. One is to just select some regressors that's called variable selection, and the other uh, is uh, lasso and ridge. But the problem with if we just select regressors and just choose some of them is that even if we have 20 regressors, there are more than a million possible subsets of regressors uh, in n choose k. So um, there, fortunately, there are clever algorithms for getting close to the full solution in uh, in these settings. So we're going to talk about that in the lecture and they talk about it in the uh, Tip Shirani, in the Hastings, Hastings Tip Shirani Friedman um, chapter. Basically some of them get to the full solution and then there are uh, algorithms that don't get the full solution but get hopefully close. They're called greedy algorithms. Then we have these shrinkage methods. There are methods basically, or penalization methods, where we have a penalized criterion. So we have, in the rich case, we have our usual OLS criterion, the squared residual, but then we also penalize the sum of squared coefficients by this num number lambda. Um, in the case of lasso, um, uh, uh, we have the same, except that it's the absolute value of the regressor. So both of these uh, give us a penalty if we have too many large coefficients. So they're going to prefer to find estimates where they get a good fit of y, but balancing that the coefficients don't get too large. And, and uh, squaring coefficients versus just using absolute values are different ways of doing this. And turns out that they have very different properties, these two. Namely that lasso will tend to set some coefficients to zero, whereas ridge will just tend to shrink all of the coefficients towards zero, but not actually set any of them equal to zero. Here we have an example of a tuning parameter that determines the penalty on the, the size of the parameter values. And in the case where lambda is zero, we have OLS for both of these. And in the case where lambda is equal to uh, infinity, we're going to set all of the betas equal to zero, and our prediction is just going to be the mean. And there's an important comment here that uh, we have to demean the data before 
uh, estimation, and this is done automatically by Lasso, uh, the implementation in, in MATLAB. So there's no estim uh, intercept being estimated. But these are the two uh, boundary cases, and this lambda parameter is not going to be identified directly from the data. Um, because uh, the lower you set lambda, if you set it to zero, you maximize the in-sample fit. So we're going to, in, and, and that's just going to get better and better the closer lambda gets to zero. So we're going to have to use cross-validation to avoid uh, having this problem of overfitting in-sample. There's an alternative geometric way of interpreting these two problems. The ridge problem and the lasso problem, they're both minimizing a squared residual subject to a constraint that either that the squared coefficients, the sum of those, are smaller than some t, or that the sum of absolute coefficients are smaller than some t. And for each of these two, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the t in this case and the lambda before, and the t in this case and the lasso lambda. And, the, and here we can get the intuition for why that results in zero coefficients. So if you look at uh, the, uh, the, the altitude curves for this minimization here, uh, square residuals, then they're epileptic. Um, so along this ridge, the, they'll have the same uh, value. If you look at uh, the constraint set, that beta squared should be smaller than some t, then that's what we have here. That's a circle. And this diamond shape here is that the sum of absolute values should be smaller than, um, than some t. So here, for example, beta 1 is, is 0 and beta 2 is 1. And here, beta 2 is 0 and beta 1 is, uh, oh, sorry, t is equal to t. So that's the different shapes. And here you can sort of sense that the, these curves here become tangential to the constraint set and of course the further um, the further uh, we move this way we want to move as close as we can to this point while still being in the constraint set and here we're going to be in the interior whereas here the, the t point of ten tangentiality occurs at where one of the coefficients is actually equal to zero so you could imagine that there's another epileptic curve going all the way here and that touches the diamond here and all the way down here but we can move in this direction then and get a better uh, criterion of minimizing the square deviation uh, here um, so that's the geometric interpretation for why in uh, in lasso where we have this diamond shaped constraint set we tend to get some of the coefficients being exactly equal to zero whereas in ridge, uh, they, they don't actually get equal to zero exactly. In fact, that's a probability zero thing. An alternative way of thinking about it is if we go back here, um, as you, s you decrease this beta towards zero, eventually, because the squared function gets very, very flat, we get very, very little benefit from the very last bit of extra movement towards zero that almost doesn't change the uh, this penalty uh, when we get close to zero. Whereas down here, we always get the, there's always a, there's a constant slope on this penalty, so we 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 keep getting the same improvement as we move it down towards zero. Uh, so that's why we don't stop, but actually set them equal to zero in the case of lasso. Uh, so that's another another way um, of providing intuition for why. Lasso will set some parameters equal to zero, whereas Ridge will not set them equal to zero, but move all of them down towards zero. All right. If we want to be formal and write up the mathematical model for Lasso, then it looks like this. Y is equal to Xi beta plus U, and U needs to be uncorrelated with the Xs, which I haven't written here, but it needs to be. And xi is n by kn, where kn, so the number of variables, grows as n grows, but at a slower rate. And this set here, the set of k's, or variables, for which beta k is non-zero, this is called the active set. That set remains small, so to speak. 
So we, as, we, as n increases, we get more and more uh, variables, but some of these new variables that we get, have uh, most of them, in fact, perhaps, have a coefficient of 0. And then consistency in, in this world is a little bit different from normally because beta hat and the true betas don't live in the same parameter space anymore. Beta hat is kn large, whereas uh, the true betas are infinitely large because we just get more and more variables. So some of the things that we talk about with, when we talk about consistency for lasso is that it finds the active set and that for all of the parameters in the active set, they get closer and closer to each other. And then that is a little bit different from thinking about normally that beta hat moves towards the true beta. Now we have to look at uh, the beta hats that we can actually see at this point because some of them won't be revealed until uh, a certain point when kh has become large enough. And if you if you were to use OLS on this, and you're going to have to you're going to find many spur uh, a lot of spurious correlation because you have so many regressors. So it's going to set a lot of the betas non-zero for the ones uh, that are not in the active set. So OLS doesn't find the, the the true parameters. And the lasso has a property that's known as the oracle property. And the intuition in this property is that lasso performs as well on the active set as if you've done OLS where you know the active set. So in other words, uh, lasso works as well as OLS uh, where you tell OLS which of the coefficients are non-zero. Um, and the implication of this, and this is of course, it's a hard thing to say again, because normally when we think about uh, OLS, we think about comparing beta hat and the true betas, but the true betas, there are many, 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 many of those, uh, because they, we get, again, we get more and more variables as n increases. Um, so this result is kind of, uh, it, it states that including the irrelevant regressors is free in some sense of the word, but this is an asymptotic result, so there may be a small sample bias still. Um, yeah, the oracle property is a very uh, deep mathematical thing. It's an inequality uh, property um, that can be shown to hold asymptotically. Um, but this is kind of the, the intuition in it.